this is Gareth aka Audio and welcome to the first Virus Recordings Advanced Production Tutorial. Hopefully over the next few minutes we'll be giving you an insight into how we go about creating, editing and mixing the track. In this case we'll be breaking down my track Headroom off my forthcoming album Soul Magnet on Virus. Concentrating on the construction of the drums, the bass and the sounds and the mixing process. Hope you enjoy it. Before we start on the track, we're going to talk about my default song settings, which optimizes my workflow. Firstly, I have four buses set up, one for the drums, one for the bass, one for pads, and the last one for effects and stabs and general bits and bobs. To help organize and assist in the mixing process, this is, ver this is vital. On the master bus, the first thing in the chain is a spectrum analyzer. This is vital so you're not just relying on what your ears are telling you. So you've got a visual reference to where the frequencies are and where you need them to be hitting, whether it be a bass, kick drum, snares, or your top end frequencies. This is vital. You shouldn't be doing anything without a spectrum analyzer. After that, this is something I do because it assists me when I'm browsing for samples, which is what I have this tuner. So as I'm flicking through samples and it's playing it in real time, it's telling me what key it's in. So it's easier for me to relate whether it's going to work in my track, whether I've got to pitch it up, pitch it down. Basically, is it going to work? And it, it, it's, it's just a tool that I find really, really useful. Next is the camel fat. This thing is amazing. It's, it's probably one of the most used plugins that I have. I use it on everything. And it has an amazing ability when you default the settings, which is the clear the preset, and you turn everything off, it doesn't let anything go over zero. It doesn't squash it, it's not compressing it, it's not really limiting it, it's not pulling it up, it just puts a ceiling on stuff. So it's really, really handy. And I use that before I put it into the limiter, so I know that nothing is going over zero. And then brings us on to the limiter. I use Ozone 5. I think this is brilliant. Um, there's lots of different elements that you can use in it. I don't use hardly any of it. It's all good. The only things I use, Harmonic Exciter, just to add a little bit from about 10K upwards. Just give it a little bit of air and just to widen it. Next is just a maximizer. Um, just to pull it out, give me that final level so the DJs will play it. You know, the it has to be loud. It's, uh, it's the rule nowadays. Now we get onto the track in question, Headroom, taken from my forthcoming album, Soul Magnet on Virus. This is the final arrangement of the track, and the first thing you can see is that I've colour coded the parts. All the drum and percussion parts are in blue, all the bass elements are in red, and everything else is a nice shade of turquoise for some reason. I don't know why, but it's turquoise today. Sometimes I go for baby pink, you know, it depends. When starting a new tune, I always start with the drums. For me, it's the backbone of the track. It decides on what vibe I'm going in, whether it's going to be kind of big and bashy and or kind of deep and techy and rolling. It's kind of it's it's the starting point for for everything I do. So you can see here on the mixer, all those parts are in blue. They all go to that drum bus. And on the drum bus have a few elements and there's a camel fat again but we'll get into that later the break in this tune um, is a, uh, a purdy break which is a very old funk break um, which is kind of a staple in drummer basis where it all kind of started from was old breaks chopped up and and rehashed and uh, and kind of that's where the influence came from so for this I wanted to get back to that because I've kind of spent a long time using very processed drums um, synthetic kicks and snares and kind of created loops like that I wanted to get back to kind of the original so I chopped um, this break up um, so as you can see here that's my kick drum that's my snare that's a kick layer which adds a little bit of tops to it and that's a hi-hat and basically I got the break I zoomed in 
are chopped. These, these are, this is all information that you'll know and you'll know how to do this at this point. You know, you'll, you'll know how to get a break. You have to chop it up and get the, you know, you get everything clean and tidy and you'll rearrange the break in your, in your arrangement. I split everything up. Um, because I find it easier when I'm coming to kind of moving my groove around and where I want the hats and where I want the snares and the kick drums etc I just find it easier like this um, when I get a break like this and I, and I kind of spend a little bit of time on it and I kind of process it quite a lot I'll always bounce it out so I've always got that break forever in my, in my, in my sort of arsenal of, of beats and breaks that I've bounced out um, I can't kind of push that enough if you have a break and it's great and it's in a song that you're not really doing anything with bounce it out um, don't be afraid to kind of go back and kind of excuse the term but rape and pillage like all your old tracks for kind of elements there's lots of tunes that I've done which are kind of the breaks from one track the bass from another um, you know if it's not firing but you've got a loop kind of it's not discarded um, so that's why I bounce everything out so I've always got that stuff um, and, that, and this is basically what this is, it's a bounce out of that break, brought back in and put into a different arrangement. As you can see the kick, the snare uh, and the kick layer are all individual and this layer here, the hats, is basically the hat groove that I've selected um, and I've, con I've consolidated that into one piece of audio just to help me in the arrangement process um, and it's a simple you know, audio functions consolidate, you'll have it in whatever door you use you'll know the shortcut to do that. Um, and that's another thing I can't kind of push enough as well is consolidating stuff just to make it easy. You can see I've done it with a shaker. Uh, I've done it with that other layer of percussion there. That's another hat loop. That's kind of a live hat loop. I think that's from a sample pack. Um, and it's the same thing. I kind of chopped it, rearranged it, did what I wanted to do with it and then consolidate it into one chunk. It, it, it makes life so much easier when you're in, in the arrangement process of a track. Um, the drums are quite simple on this tune. Um, it is an old funk break. That's what I wanted. I didn't want it to be clouded. I wanted it to punch through. You could tell the character of the snare, the kick, and that's what I wanted. So you can see this is the drum parts um, for, the, for the break. Um, I think there's some drum shuffles that come in here, different shakes just to kind of cut from different things. Um, old drunk funk loops. This here as well, that's another uh, funk break as well for the turnaround at the end of the bar. I've added old funk drum loops just to kind of maintain that old funk feel to it. Um, the particular break that I, I looped didn't have any particular feels, otherwise I'd have used them to keep that character through. Um, but for this I kind of wanted a completely different feel for the edit. So, um, they sound completely different, but they're very live and bashy, and they kind of give that real difference to the edit, to the main section. Now you can see we've zoomed into the drum parts, um, and these are the main drum elements. This is the, the purdy kick, that's the purdy snare, that is a top layer um, for the kick drum, but we'll get onto that. Um, and let's put this through. Now this is the benefit of the spectrum analyzer and having it constantly on and constantly there so you're not just relying on your on your ears so as you can see when we're putting this kick drum through there's no real low end information we've got a big whack at 100 which is good and we've got a nice whack at about 2.5k which is really what we want with it we want the knock and the weight of the kick drum but with no weight where the sub's going to go which is what you know already moving on to the snare you see the snare drum, and the main frequency in the snare drum is hitting at 250. Um, that's what we want. No low end information, a nice amount of tops, but just the main frequency popping at 250. That will make sure it cuts through the mix when you play this at ridiculous wattage for a big system. It will make sure that that snare is punching through and a constant through the track. It doesn't get lost, it's always there. And that's the same with the kick drum when it's hitting at 100. It's not interfering with anything, and it's a constant through the track. Next is the top layer of the kick drum. Now this was purely just to add some tops to it because the, the, the purdy break, the kick was a little bit dull um, and I needed it, um, I needed some tops in it. So I think you'll find that the 2.5 is actually where 
um, is, is come from this layer here. So there's actually nothing on the on the on the Purdy. This kick, this this layer here has got no low information at all. We don't need it. We want these two to basically blend and become one sample. We play these together with the, the hi hat. You can see the whole drum pattern: kick drum at 100, snare at 250, and a nice amount of tops. Not too harsh, but just right. So that was the main part of the drums done: the hats, the purdy break, the layer for the kick drum, and the snare. But it still needed a little bit. Um, it was a bit static. It needed a little bit more of a live feel to it. So I pulled some samples in, some some loops in, um, and there's a shaker loop there. Um, your standard kind of jungle shaker, um, but works, cuts through the mix, sounds great, and we all love it. Um, next is a another hi hat loop. Um, just to just to add that a little bit more of another groove. That's just hitting on every one. Um, and the same for this other one, I think that's actually from a sample pack which I've chopped up, rearranged um, and like I said earlier, consolidated together. You can see them three channels are consolidated just to make it easier so I can just grab the whole thing and copy it across. Um, so moving on to that, that's all the drum parts. Like I said, there's not really that many drums in this and usually I'm kind of a, a bit of a culprit for using a lot more drum parts but this one is... is is uh is quite sparse but it's just kind of proof that you can make a tune and you don't need to have um four kicks layered up with nine snares and um four raymonds high passed underneath it all um you can make a break work and be loud enough and be funky enough and it's definitely got the funk because you know it was, it's played by hand so yeah get some old breaks chop them up and see what you can get done next we move on to the uh the drum bus so all those parts you can see all go into my drum bus. And first in that chain is the camel fat again. So you clear preset as we did before and turn on the distortion unit. And on here I have a, a small amount of tube, literally kind of 2% two, two I think it's on, 2%, yeah. Uh, an exciter on, on the same. And I got that from the upbeats. That's something that they do. Um, and it just kind of, it pulls the drums together. It kind of excites them. It just kind of adds them a little bit of sort of sparkle at the top. I don't know what it does. It sounds good. I like it. I like upbeats tunes. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that's, yeah, that's how, it, that's how we do. So since, since I kind of learned that, it's kind of something I've always done. And it kind of just works for me. And I, I really like it. So that's the first in the chain. Next is... Um, the Fab Filter Pro Q, and this is just taking all the tops off. Um, this has got a, a simple high cut at about 20k because that's just, that's not even, there's no point in having that there. You can't cut that to vinyl, it gets chopped off, and that's for real. It's not there. It's not some people get it in there, and it's, you know, some people don't. It gets chopped off. No one gets that frequency in there, so it's not really worth having it in there. Usually, I'd have a low cut down here as well, um, which I would just add onto there um, and kind of pull up and there. But I've already done that because this, this drum loop was already bounced out of another project, like I said earlier, um, bouncing loops out. You get them processed, you don't have to do this because you know you've already done it before. Um, it's kind of a, a, you know, a, a time saving thing. So that's why there's no low cut on there, otherwise there would be. And um, why would you use a low cut? There, so, um, I'd mean so the the bass line could be more audible. The low cut would be there as well as the tops is 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 not required. The low cut would there is to purely just to make room for the sub, um, because you it's one thing you don't want, and it's one thing you'll hear is your kick drum interfering with your sub. You'll hear this muddy kind of punch. Things will start flapping, and the mix won't get loud. You'll see big peaks. Your meters will be going up and down. And, it, and it's not good so that's why we cut there we keep saying it everyone says it it is that important cut it off and cut it off at the top um, so yeah after the pro Q, I've actually got a small amount of reverb on the whole break which is not something I usually do but sometimes with an old break it helps to pull it together especially if it's an old front break that you've had to chop up and you've 
um, adjusted the decay amount and you've had to take that decay amount quite down and quite short and you've made it quite uh, quite bitty sounding and you need to get a little bit of a tail back into your in, in, into the drum parts this is what I use a reverb for but the reverb is on a very very small amount of wet that's a dry wet ratio it's only slightly on there we sit on a on a on a bright room uh, there's no low end information on the reverb obviously if you don't want any uh, any stereo or reverbs in 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 low frequencies uh, a little bit of mid information a little bit of tops but it just it just gels things together it just gives all those elements a little tail and kind of they overlap they overlap each other and it kind of gels the brake back together because you've done major surgery to an old front brake you've chopped it up you've rearranged it you've put it you've eq'd it you've distorted it you've done whatever it, it just kind of glues it back together so that's the reason for uh the reverb i wouldn't necessarily do that on synthes like synthesized or kind of fake drums you know kind of your vengeance packs kind of stuff because you kind of want that sound you want that kind of tight really produced kind of sound but this wanted the live drum sound so hence reverb and the last in the chain is the secret weapon is the satsun channel if you haven't got this go and buy it um i got recommended this from a uh, i went into uh, tech hitch's house i'm going to plug his name because he's a bad man in the studio and he told me about this um, and it's a secret weapon and it's a very cheap little plug-in I think it's like $40 and it's it's just great on drum brakes you can just drive it it's got an old sort of VU style meter um, flip it around auto um, output compensation otherwise it would just be blowing everything up it's got a great low cut it's got a great high cut and it just gives those brakes and it, it gives that little push sound so it, so yeah that's um, highly recommended so that's driven all the way around and it's just it's just crunching the drums up trying to get that old analog feel to the drums um and that's it that's the drum bus that's it broken down um yeah moving on from the drums and the drum bus we go on to the bass um and obviously when you start a track um, you've got various different um, sources where you can get your bass line from and, and where people kind of like to get their, their material from either from a synth um, and kind of run it straight from the synth live or, or bounce that down um, twist it, distort it, bend it inside out, resample it, put it back in, do the same again um, and keep doing that or use old samples um, that have got that kind of character and twist that up. That's kind of the old school way that we all kind of started how to do it. You know, you get a bass line that someone else had done and uh, <laughs> rip it up and twist it and, and chop it. And and that was a starting point. So when, you, when you're starting a track, obviously where you get your drums from, you've got to decide where you get your bass from. So for this track, Headroom, because the drums were um, an old funk loop, I wanted the bass to be um, quite clinical um, and, and kind of, be a contrast to the the funk and the kind of rawness of the drums i wanted kind of a really a really kind of um synthesized really pushed sounding bass line um so as you can see here it's a midi part and we've zoomed into it um it's not um i'm not the greatest melody maker of uh, in in the history of drum and bass um you can't beat a one note bass line um especially if there's lots of movement in it um it doesn't really matter um, and and this is this is the, the bass part basically uh, the synth I used to make this um, was massive the trusty massive um, a lot of people slate it a lot of people go oh you can't use it anymore because people have you know it's been used to death and I think if you're still getting something fresh sounding out of it and you know and it's working for you you keep using it you know it's endless possibilities, it's endless possibilities that you can do to the signal after it's left this through your chain of effects. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll go for a, a rough breakdown of um, of this. Basically got uh, one oscillator running with the uh, Deorg patch, not modern talking, uh, like a lot of people like to use. Um, and we've got a, a little bit of automation of, of filtering going on there. We've got the band reject on filter one with the cutoff, and that is being sent to uh, a, um, a performance. 
Um, obviously with, uh, with Massive you have the LFO, the Performer or the Stepper. Um, and in this case I've used the Performer. Um, it's on restart, so if you can look at my MIDI part there, it's made up of um, kind of shorter hits. Um, so it's not one continuous note that I want to, uh, to evolve or modulate halfway through. I just want it to restart every time I trigger that sound. Um, and that's how I kind of get that kind of um, throbbing kind of sound to it, that it restarts the, uh, the LFO and the performer every time. Um, on top of that, it's also being sent, uh, the signal um, is being sent to a normal LFO, which is only doing, you can see here the automation that's only flicking from, you know, from say 11 o'clock round to three o'clock. Um, and five is going um, from one o'clock right round to five. So they're not doing the whole rotation, they're just doing, it's just adding slight amount of movement to the sound. Um, in this track as well, um, the, the bass part kind of switches halfway through. It does a very kind of high um, gnawing kind of sound as it drops, and then it kind of it, it 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 kind of drops lower. It seems to drop lower, and that's basically me just automating the uh, the position of the of the um, the selected oscillator, um, literally from from there to kind of there and back down again, and that was it. It was done by chance. I like the sound of it, and it kind of worked really well as a switch, just to kind of add a little bit of interest. Um, and it makes it hit even harder when it comes back round with the full bass again. Um, so yeah, basically, uh, what else have we got? Go down here. We've got the white noise is on. Um, the the shaper is on, doing quite a lot of damage on that. And that's kind of um, if you take that off. Um, the sound doesn't sound anything like it. It's kind of doing quite a lot there, um, just with the amount of movement that it has, and then running it through that, it kind of amplifies that movement, twists it up, and kind of um, spits it out in a in a in a in a in a good way. Going up to the effects, um, I've got the little the the cube the the, um, the the tube distortion um, on there, and that's fully wet, fully driven round. So that's that's kind of responsible for the sound as well. And then I've got the um, dimension expander just to widen it up um, and kind of give it um, a little bit of kind of width at the top. Um, and that's basically it. That's, I mean, this is quite a rarity for me to kind of um, for, to do a baseline just in one uh, instance of massive. I mean, this is doing the low end. This is doing the whole shebang. Um, I haven't got another sub layer doing underneath. This is the sub, this is the tops, this is the mids, but it kind of works um, and it really works in a club. Um, so I kind of run with it and you know, when things work, you don't argue with it. So if I've missed anything there, oh, the modulation uh, is on there as well, the little bit of phase. Um, but they're all things, you know, Working out and, and making synths is, is kind of very personal, and, and you've all, you know, you'll all have your own ways of doing it. This is just my way of doing it in this instance. It didn't take me bouncing it out, it was fine as it is, so I'm running it live from the synth in the track. Um, like I said, there's only one instance of it, it's not CPU heavy, so um, yeah, we can run with it. Um, so that's that, that's the massive part. Um, and to go alongside that, once I'd done the track. Um, I felt that um, it was a little bit dry, the bass was a little bit dry and kind of the top, kind of 10k upwards. Um, so what I did was once I'd arranged the track and finished it because I, I did this track quite quickly. Um, so I did it all and I, I soloed the, the, the bass channel and I bounced it out and I brought it back in again. So as you can see that layer, this layer here, the one underneath, is the full bass layer with all the automation. You can see there, there's some high pass filter in there, back out again. Um, and there's some the automation here that's just pitch information that's basically just taking it up um, let's just have a look an octave that's all it's doing um, so with the top layer of the base it's got all the automation like I said earlier um, and what I did is I added an EQ to that and took all the low-end information out of it so it's very very it's 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 probably got everything taken out of it from um, 
20k you know no 10k downwards you know it is really that drastic but on top of that i've added a lot of reverb um you can see the dry wet ratio is really wet the k is not too long um, um but it's just an ambient patch i think and i've just twisted it a little bit but just it just it gave it it gave the bass line a little bit of life at the top end it kind of um it made it a little bit kind of not a static kind of um the reverb gave tails to it it kind of bled into each other and it, 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 it did what i needed it to do um and that's it that's the bass channel um as the drums are very simple again the bass is very simple in this track it's it's just that basically um so yeah Moving on from the main bass and the top layer of bass is the bass automation channel. Um, there's not that much going on in here. Um, there's a low cut frequency, um, which is doing a you know low cut filter, and you can see the automation there at the end of the bar. It's coming in, and then it's doing the reverse back there. Same again, same again, and that basically runs throughout the track, and that's just the low cut frequency filter. We select through back through it again. We've got a high cut filter. You can see that's just doing a little bit of automation there. Again, at the end of the bars and some kind of edits into the bar for the build up for the second drop, and basically duplicated there again for the for the outro. And why would you be using those things? Just to add something. The reason you'd add high cut and low cut is just to add. Um, more interest to what you're doing and, and, and to the track um, I mean you can use low cuts to, to great effect um, at the end of the bars because obviously you're taking all the weight I mean th this bass frequency this bass uh, filter is actually on the drum bus so it's doing both those channels this filter is affecting okay um, so to create kind of extra drops and kind of more impact in your track it's kind of nice to kind of take the weight out of it and then drop it back in again. So, and over, if you do that over a long period of time, it's kind of a build up, a progression. Um, it just adds interest to what you're doing and, and keeps things keeps things bubbling along. Um, so I've done quite a lot of it in this track, but it just adds to the to the impact of, of, of the tune when it comes back in again. So we've talked about the main bass, we've talked about the bass layer, and now we've talked about the automation lane for the bass. We'll move on to the bass bus itself. Um, if we have a look what's in here again we've got the camel fat um, and that's basically doing the same thing again which I talked about on the uh, on the drum bus and on the master I just find this thing so useful not just for distortions and, and kind of and creating movement and stuff but just for this fact alone so you clear preset um, and in this case um, the distortions on I've got a little bit of tube again and a little bit of exciter again, just the same as I did on a drum bus. I just find it controls it, fattens it up, and gets it nice. Um, and then this thing here, I'm not actually using it. It's on, but it's not. Um, it's not actually the, the the wet is not actually turned up. But this is quite a good idea. Um, it's quite a good little tip when you're doing build ups and drop downs and kind of you know second drops or, or whatever. Quite a nice tip with your mid range bass if you kind of low cut and have it really really kind of quiet and, and, and high pass, low cutted coming in into the mix and have the reverb very, very wet, as wet as it will go and automate that, will automate that reverb to become, to become drier and drier as you progress down the build up. And as all the other elements start building up, your mid range from becoming an inaudible kind of reverby mess suddenly starts to take shape as the mid range of your track. And then just in time for the drop, it all comes together and it kind of, you kind of get this suck, sucked in feeling um, and it just adds more impact so um, that's a little tip there not actually using it in this track but it's something that I do quite often and that's the bass bus that's all that's there um, and that's it like I said this track's very simple um, and, and those are the main elements the drums and the bass next we'll be moving on to pads and effects So moving on from the drums and the bass, um, we'll attempt to I will attempt to explain the other elements. Um, and these elements are just as important as the bass and drums because the incidental kind of stuff gives you, uh, you know, it gives you that character of a track, gives it personality. Um, 
it's the, it, not just it, especially in this kind of drum and bass where it's it's not melody driven you know you're not going to be humming this track headroom when you go down you know the road there's no melody for it so you have to give it something character in a different way um and a big thing for me has always been to sample films um and and to get material from that way um and just generally kind of i'm influenced from that sort of soundtracky vibe so we'll kind of break i'll try and break down what i've added and why i added it first of all um is the pad there's only one uh one pad that i used in the track um and it's the uh gladiator the tone 2 gladiator um an amazing synth um i find for textures arpeggios chords um kind of weird kind of build rises um it's got a really nice tone and timbre to it um and i just like it for that I kind of i don't usually use it for basses i have done very rarely but usually it's for pads and chords um so it's just um a, again i would have started like most people do with a patch i flick through the patches um i find something that's kind of that kind of that gets my attention for one reason or another whether i think it, it suits the mood of the track or there's a particular tone that sticks out or i like the movement in it or whatever and that's a starting point for me and then i'll, I'll kind of fiddle with it um i probably couldn't tell you exactly everything i've done with this pad to kind of make it my own but i have i've done a few bits um there's some automation as well let's have a look at the automation uh, and that's the filter cutoff uh, of the of the synth there, which is just basically bringing it down from low, like a really low kind of rumble, inaudible, as it progresses uh, into a clearer, and 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 that just kind of goes up and down through the intro, just to create movement and interest as the track progresses, instead of you just playing the notes and and having some delay or reverb at the end, actually tonally change what the synth's doing uh, and give it some character. Let's see what else is on there that's actually it that's the only um, automation that's on there um, and that's the only that's the like I said that's the main pad through the track let's go back up through um, here this there's, there's a drone effect here um, I'm a great advocate for sample packs I spend a lot of money on sample packs um, I find them very helpful and useful I don't have any problem using them um, some people find it you know a big ego problem that they use a sample pack but that's what they're made for and that's why you buy them um, is to use them um, and I find using samples and, and using sample packs from other genres and other producers really inspiring in what I do um, because I'll hear something that might take me in a tangent that I wouldn't have necessarily gone on on my own without hearing that sample so um, a lot of the samples that you'll see peppered throughout this track are from sample packs um some of them i've like i've done before i've i've twisted or i've kind of time stretched um i've consolidated again so that's where you see kind of a nice neat piece of audio it's not chopped and you don't see a lot of things in it because i've already done that and consolidated it uh once i'm happy with it so if we go over here there's uh there's a, a kind of african chanting sound um that builds up um halfway through the drum roll and, and that is a prime example of hearing that in a sample pack uh, and I just liked it and I just like the rhythmic nature of it it's quite a basic you know kind of ba back to basics drum and bass tune it is you know it's drums and bass so kind of having that kind of the African chant in the kind of rhythmic thing on the top of it seemed really appealing um, and, and to kind of make it different and make it and kind of make it do something and add to the track um, I chopped into it every little section um, and basically lifted it up a semitone at a time so if we zoom into it you can see at every point you can't see it now because again I've consolidated it into a neat piece of audio but I went through and chopped at every on every bar and lifted each section up one semitone to get that high pitch and, and it maintained the time stretching um, and it kind of gave me the effect that I wanted that it kind of sounds normal and then pitches up with the drum rolls in, uh, uh, building up and the rises, so it kind of it leads to quite a big, uh, a big build up. I also use a stab or one hit from the African chanting that hits on the one bar. It's actually kind of like a, 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 a kind of 
a start of the track really it's kind of what you hear when the first when the, when the kick drum hits it hits there uh, and then the bass kind of drops in on the snare um if we look here so there's a space there the, the, the bass comes in on the snare so there's all that room it's just the kick drum and the little hay vocal but it works really really well and it ties in lovely with the build up and uh throughout the drop and it's kind of it's nice to have things that um that pop up throughout the track they kind of lock it together um it's nice to have things very free form um and very kind of crazy and and, and doing it but you need things that you hear repetitively you know because that's what we're into we're into repetitive music and the idea is that that it works it's loop based music it's building loops upon loops so it's nice to have things that repeat again and again and and, and that is that uh, vocal again with a crash um same thing just to punctuate the the beginning of the bars i don't have them too often but it's just nice to kind of emphasize the start of a new bar um there's some mid-range here these are just kind of incidental mid-ranges they don't go um over the drop they're just there throughout the through the build-up because uh, 49 uh, is the drop of the track um, so they run throughout the intro to, to to build interest to kind of build you into you know what's going to happen what's coming um so though yeah those four layers there are mid-range incidentals this is the man and machine vocal which i actually stole from ed rush um he came down to do a collab and he bought two vocals and i stole both of them um and use both of them <laughs> so yeah so this is one of them man and machine i don't know where he got it from i just put it in there it kind of worked i liked it and that's about as far as it goes you know like making music should be kind of quite an immediate thing you don't need to spend six months thinking about whether a vocal works in your track you know just if it if it sounds good and you like it get it in there move on uh, and get the music done um another thing that's in um the build up is kind of like a, a quite a like a bongo congo driven build up um and their samples and loops from the vengeance packs everyone knows the vengeance packs if you don't get to know they're great um but the fill-ins basically i went through selected three or four that i really liked um and and, and chopped into them basically having a slow on one to start uh, a, a smaller kind of edity one at the end of the bar uh, again a different edit that bar speeding up um and again and again and it kind of uh with that backed with um the drum roll as well you can see that it comes in on the fours and then increases increases and faster um it kind of adds to quite a, a chaotic build up which is kind of what you want really you want to, to drive the drive the kids crazy um so yeah that's the crash the vocal the mid-range parts the vocal the main vocal a reverse crash um i think that is just to kind of to suck it into the drop um what else have we got here uh and a build up i think oh, it's actually a build down that i've reversed so yeah you can use drop downs but just reverse them and it's a build up suddenly and you can use that so back to uh going through the mid-range parts um the all these elements have been eq'd individually um and then bust through uh, they've all got instead of um, applying an EQ to the bus that they go to and applying that same EQ to all of those sounds I've EQ'd them all individually so I've just treated them all as individual channels like you would but then just bust them together just to keep it tidy uh, for mix down and, and kind of arrangement wise um, so they've all got a low cut um, and getting rid of the frequencies you don't need is that they've you know if something's got a lot of tops and you don't need it get rid of it like I said before if it's got lots of bottom end and it's not your base get rid of it because it's only going to cloud your mix um, and a track like this it's very simple I need I needed as much space as possible to get the drums and the bass as loud as I could um, and you know um, to get it to, to get the mix balanced and sounding right the also the, the important thing as well when you're adding stuff like this is, is to is to make sure that you're adding it for a reason you know if, if you've got five channels of you know i know we're going back to drums but if you've got five channels of hi-hats and you can mute three of them and you don't hear any difference well that's telling you something 
you know that all that's doing is clouding your mix it's not adding anything to sonically what you can hear through the speakers um so don't be afraid to cull things and that just that applies for drums bass and mid-range stuff you know placement is vital as well um i like to f i like to fill gaps i like to find gaps and fill them with things that kind of talk to each other so especially mid-range parts um i don't care where they come from but if they sound good back to back with each other or bouncing off each other it goes in my track um so that's another thing don't be afraid of where the source comes from if it's a vocal if it's a drum if it's a bongo if it's a a, 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 a penguin mating call reversed and distorted it doesn't matter if it sounds good put it in there um and just be wary of placement and the reason why you're putting it in your track. So we've talked about the drums, the drum bus, the bass, the bass bus, uh, the pads uh, and the incidentals, the effects, the vocals, the, the mid ranges that go go into making a track. So once you've got all these elements in place um, and you're sending this uh, this huge signal to your to your master bus, <clears throat> I'm going to explain how I do mine. So going back to the spectrum analyzer with the full track running through um, uh, through the spectrum. As you can see, um, the kick drum is hitting a, is hitting there at 100, the snare at 250, and the bass at around. All right, we're running an F note, so around 46, 47 hertz thousand hertz down there uh, and for the for the bass I always have that slightly under and this is just this is obviously just regarding this particular spectrum analyzer this is just my rule of thumb which is not how you should do it this is just how I work um, but I have it slightly one pixel line underneath the 10 I know it sounds funny but that's where my bass sits my kick drum sits bang on the zero um, and the, the the snare drum just sits slightly above that just so it's popping through um, and nothing else going above that 10 line, um, just the snare. Um, and that's before the limiting stage, because obviously in our chain, that's before the limiting. So that's how I have it. That's my rule. Before I send it to the limiter, that's how I have my track balanced, because I find that it's enough weight, the, the drums are not too loud, and the tops are nice. So moving down from the spectrum analyzer, go down to camel fat, the trusty camel fat. Again, like I said earlier, at the start of the tutorial we cleared the preset so it's not actually doing anything but it's got this amazing ability not to let anything go above zero and that's below that's first in the in the chain before the limiter so i know whatever the signal i'm sending to the limiter it's not going above zero so the limiter is not already maxed out and pushed because i'm not going over what it can do i'm, I'm, I'm sitting at zero so anything underneath that when i put it through the limiter will, will be pulled up to zero so close that down and then the ozone five obviously this depends per track these these rules of thumb you'll find will differ from track to track you will never be able to approach the same track uh, a different track the same way sorry um, you can use it as a rough guide but all the time my threshold will move slightly even though i have the same i'm hitting on the same levels kick drums are different basses are different and when these frequencies start stacking up they give you different results um, so you're going to have to kind of adjust this to suit the track. Um, one thing that we didn't actually talk about at the start is the fact that I actually write the track with the limiter on constantly. Um, I find this is the best way to keep the dynamics of the track um, and maximize the volume that you can get out of it. So you're basically getting the best of both worlds. Um, I've spoken to mastering engineers and 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 it kind of works that you know they've they've kind of said that you know i always thought i was crazy doing that way i did i did it in reason when i used to work in reason i work with the limiter on and i work with the limiter on now um there's probably a few producers that wouldn't like to admit that they uh that they don't that they actually use a limiter when they're writing and and, and you know they're that amazing they can get it that loud but you know it, it works for me um what else have I got in here? The transient recovery, let's have a look at this. So I've got a threshold on, on headroom down to 2.6, just bringing the signal back up as loud as I can. But obviously bringing that down to the point where it distorts and then backing back off a little bit. Um, I don't personally like digital distortion um, because I kind of started on analog gear, so I know what 
uh, what it sounds like running stuff hot through a desk and it sounds amazing and doesn't digital does not sound like that um, I've got the character right down clipping so it's brick walled hard it's not smooth it's coming straight back in and slamming it um, transient recovery I've got a little bit back up so just in case just because I'm, I'm kind of maxing the track out I just want to pull those transients out again um, obviously you know that's what's going to cut through the system that's what you're going to hear so you want those little the little pops and the cracks on your kicks and your snares to pop through so I have that kind of pulled up a little bit just so it kind of assists in pulling them back through and the stereo link um, what else have I got and like I said before a little bit of the harmonic that's a kind of that doesn't really change per track because I kind of always only add a slight amount and it's only just at the top there um, and it's kind of incidental so I don't usually find myself changing that but the maximizer I do um, and that's basically it that is the rundown of the track um, from drums to bass um, to pads to effects to how I EQ it how I master it slightly um, I hope it's been helpful, I hope you found it interesting, I hope I've not waffled too much, um, yeah, until next time.